five on this and just decide. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Bader. I am from Johnson Hammer the Combustion here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, here with some very bundled up students from Tulsa University, South University Dakota State. What's that? University of Tulsa. I'm, I'm an Oklahoma State grad, so you have to <laughs> forgive me. They call us TU. Yeah. That's really dumb. As opposed to UT, which yeah, is in Austin. That right? would make sense. Fair enough. I see all the South Dakota students are in their T-shirts because it's only 20 degrees a day. <laughs> um, so again, my name is Adam Bader. I have worked with John Zink for 13 years. Um, I again went to Oklahoma State, got a degree in mechanical engineering technology. Um, fell into this job at John Zink right out of school, and it's one of these things that I didn't even know this whole field existed. Right, so went to school, be a mechanical engineer. Sounds great, it's versatile, get a great job, pay some decent money. And I knew what refineries were, I knew what gas plants were, I didn't know what they did, um, at least on the detail level. But now I work in a subfield that I had no idea existed, and now I know far more about than I ever even thought uh, I could learn about the subject. So it's been good. I've been there for 13 years. I worked with our flare group, which I think you guys learned about earlier. They make the nice, big, tall, cool, exciting looking flames. I work now in a thermal oxidizer group which we'll learn about today. Uh, thermal oxidizers, um, well, you've learned about all of the, the you know, front end stuff in the plants. You learn about process burners, the heaters, that's where they make the money. That's the one that really care a lot about in terms of how the plants operate, the optimization for there. You learn about vapor recovery, where they recover gases so they can resell that, right? You learn how they, they can recover those gases um, so they don't just waste it bring it to atmosphere, you learn about flares, which is a big safety relief that prevents the plants from blowing up on a day-to-day -day basis. And so the last part of that is what you do with all the chemicals and all the gases and everything else that you can't sell for product or reuse somewhere else, um, sell to somebody else, well, or the trash can for the plant, all right? So real exciting, Ex really exciting. I can tell you guys are super jazzed to hear about this. But um, there actually is some really neat things with this technology we do. So a thermal oxidizer, you get down to it, is, is basically the, the last thing in the, in the plant. So today we're going to learn a bit about the basics of what a thermal oxidizer looks like. Um, I'm going to focus mainly on kind of the, the concepts of what a TO looks like and does today. And on Thursday we'll go into some, the depth of some of the chemistry that's involved. I'm a mechanical engineer, so apologies to the chemies, which is most of you here. Um, to the two or three mechanical people, good choice. All right, I think it's even like a business major in here somewhere, is that right? I don't know, maybe not, okay. Well, we can forget about them anyway. So we'll talk about TOs, um, talk about some of the basic principles of it, and then lead into kind of what we're gonna talk about for, for Thursday. So feel free to ask questions too, I'm sure they tell you every time, but um, please do so. For South Dakota, can they chime in if they need to? Is there a way for South Dakota to ask a question if they have to? Yes, they can talk yeah. right now. All right, see. All right. Um, I'm sure all of you bought this very expensive book, like they tell you to do, right? You shouldn't, um, not until you unless you need to. Actually, it's a really great book, um, but if you happen to, to you know, pick one up, I'm sure you can go into the library. You know, Chuck is very involved in TU. I'm sure they have them here. Uh, there's three volumes of this. We're going to focus mainly on volume three of this. Uh, that's what's referenced there. And there are several chapters in particular which I've referenced there for you. Um, chapter 12 is my personal favorite because it's written by a really, really smart guy named Adam Bader. Um, but uh, anyway, so if you have reference there, that goes a lot more into the chemistry and in depth of this. So like I said, what do we do with all these waste streams that we can't process elsewhere in the plant? Well, we incinerate it. And what does that mean? Basically, we're, we're taking these chemicals um, that, that are usually pretty nasty things. These are chemicals that that you can't really vent, you can't just put in a container and store somewhere because it's quote unquote hazardous, which is typically a bad thing. And we have to figure a way to convert that into non-hazardous materials as best we can to either be vented atmosphere or treat it further in a scrubbing system or something else like that. So um, typically the hydrocarbons, since that's what mostly refineries and petrochemical plants deal with. Um, we have some here, benzenes, toluenes, xylenes. These are the nastiest of the nasties. Usually they're not quite this bad, but we're taking those and converting them into CO2, water vapor, some heat, and maybe some H2S, again, which we can then work with 
and some other capacities. So a lot of times we're, we're either treating it to be used and cleaned up elsewhere or we're just simply converting it to, to harmless gases that we can vent to atmosphere. Um, we, we call the TO our thermal oxidizers. Um, it can also be called an incinerator. That's probably the most generic name. Um, also, they're called afterburners, combustors. We sometimes call them enclosed ground flare, which is confusing because it's not a flare at all, or a furnace. Um, even a reaction chamber is a dozen different names. The most common ones are TO, thermal oxidizer, or incinerator. So why, why do we have it? Again, we're converting these gases, but on top of that, this is a pollution control device. So we have to have very, very strict levels of control for you know, what we're converting. So in our cases, we're converting 99% plus of all the chemicals. So we call it <coughs> DRE, destruction removal efficiency. You've probably heard that term a couple times before. Um, in our case, we're talking about 99% plus. In fact, usually it's 99.99% or higher. And I think maybe Chuck talked about the, the nines principles, the two nines, the three nines, or four nines. So 99% uh, is two nines, 99.9% .9 is three nines, and so on. So we're talking four nines plus of our system. So 0.001% is non-converted uh, chemicals. And what that actual number needs to be is defined by a local regulatory body, the state, the federal, um, the, and country by country, it all differs. So one thing we're also doing is we're handling various flows of streams of gas. We're not having a set stream. So the TO can handle these kind of biometric changes relatively simple. Um, we can also handle wide ranges of different compositions. So we're giving, usually when we're designing a system, a list of 10, 12 different types of compositions. And those are their best guesses. And really, it's anything in between. So it's almost an infinite number of composition changes of what's in this gas full of 10, 20, 30 different you know, different species of gases, and we have to make sure that our unit can handle all of these. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little more, but <laughs> you've probably seen this, this three T's of combustion. You guys know? You've heard of three T's of combustion? Mm -hmm. It'll be on your test, I'm sure, so I hope you've heard of it. But three T's of combustion, time, temperature, and turbulence. So when we're treating gases, it's like baking a cake. We have to treat it at a certain temperature um, for a certain length of time with a certain mixture of oxygen. Okay, remember the, the combustion triangle? Do you guys remember that part? What's in the combustion triangle? Oh, making me think so hard. Air, ignition. Air, ignition source, yeah. And a fuel, there you go, you got it. So, you know, we need to have enough air in our system to mix with this gases to, to get there. And again, like a cake, if you don't cook it at the right temperature, if it's too low, you're gonna get a big puddle at the end. If you don't cook it long enough, same thing. Or if you cook it too long, you don't get a cake at all, you get a big burnt you know, crusty, whatever it is. So we have to cook it for the right amount of time, right amount of, right amount of uh, uh, length and time, and then at the right temperature. So if we don't, we get these products of incomplete combustion. So if we don't have the perfect mixture for the right amount of time, we won't have the right conversion for that 99% plus destruction removal efficiency. So when we're talking about a methane molecule, we're gonna burn this, we're gonna mix it with air, Ideally, we want two oxygen molecules for every piece of methane, and I'll give you CO2 and water vapor and some heat. If we don't have enough air, if we choke it, we're not going to get from perfect H2O and CO2. We're going to get a little carbon monoxide, which is a greenhouse gas and we don't want to do when we're measured on. So uh, we're trying to prevent incomplete combustion when we're designing these systems. So when we're designing the length of the chamber, the temperature of the chamber. We're trying to make sure that we avoid the, the creation of these greenhouse gases or other off gases that are um, not permitted. So for most of our systems, when we're, we're making a system, we're operating between 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit and 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit. So 1,200, 2,200, that's, that's our general range. Depending on what it is, it may be in the higher end of that. Um, if we go below 1,200, it typically is not hot enough for us to actually um, have our chemical process occur where we're breaking apart the molecules. Most of them run around 1,500 degrees. That's kind of the general industry standard. Time-wise, most of our systems are designed for, I say quarter second, really it's half a second to two seconds. That's where most of our systems are. So we have to make sure that our molecule, whatever we're combusting, is in this chamber at that temperature for 
half a second to two seconds. And so, of course, we're sizing our vessel, the diameter and length, to accommodate that. We calculate a velocity, we calculate the biometric flow, and that will give us how long we need, how big this vessel needs to be. And then we need to have mixing, right? Time temperature turbulence. So we'll, we want a, a, a we mix this gas with this air so that we have complete combustion across all the molecules. We don't want a slipstream down the middle that's burning and everything on the side doesn't, doesn't burn right. We want to make sure we mix it up properly. So we like to have very um, turbulent flow. We don't want you know, a straight shot. Typically we have mixing veins that cause it to mix around just like your, your mixer when you're making a cake, right? We want to stir it all up, make sure everything touches that oxygen molecule. So a lot of times, too, we'll also, when we're designing our systems, the way our burner ports that inject these wastes in, they come at different angles, tangentially. Um, we don't always like to put them straight in together because they need to stay in a laminar flow. We want to have this mixed together. So there's several subsets of thermal oxidizers. What, again, we call it incinerator, the top one here. We also have what we call a catalytic thermal oxidizer, which I'll talk a little bit about later and then a regenerative thermal oxidizer, or an RTO. Um, they all achieve the same thing, but they kind of get there in different ways. Um, primarily, we're going to focus on the direct flame because those are the big exciting ones. That's what most of the industry does for what we're talking about in refineries. The, the catalytic and regenerative types, um, they are very useful technologies, actually can, can save you time and money on your resources, but typically they're a little more boutique or smaller, smaller units, but we'll talk about them anyway. But for now, I'll talk about direct flame. These are the ones that John Zink typically deals with. These are the ones you're going to see at the Holly Frontier facility across the way. Um, you won't know you're looking at them, but you'll see the stack that's associated with it here. But this is what it looks like. It's, it's a little burner. We have fuel and air coming into. We'll have a combustion chamber. That's this big section. That's the biggest part of the system here. And then somewhere in there, we'll either have the waste come in with the burner, or in this case, it's showing coming in the chamber. We'll burn in this, and then we'll come out the stack. We don't want to have it just come straight out here because how hot is this? It's like 1,000 degrees, 2,000 degrees. So we can't just shoot it out into the, in the atmosphere. We've got to stick it up in the air so we can have dispersion of whatever's left in there. And also, it's very, very hot, so we've got to be careful of that. That's a very basic thermal oxidizer. Fuel, air, waste, and we burn it up in this big chamber, and out the stack it goes. skip over this. So it's more complicated than that, though. That's just the real basic section. But here's what a, a more typical TO looks like. We'll have a burner, which actually is comprised of typically a fuel lance down the middle that's injecting your fuel. It'll have a pilot, like your hot water heater. It's got a pilot on it to, to light that natural gas so you heat your water. We have to have something to light that main fuel gas. And they'll mix together with our waste and air. We have to have air come in there either by a blower we we'll have a blower shooting air in, or we have a, a damper that you can open up to let air in. All that mixes and creates a fire and then comes out into this chamber. This chamber is very hot, right? We're talking 2,000 degrees. We can't just put steel in there. We'll melt the system. People have tried it. It doesn't work. Um, so we line it with refractory. Uh, refractory is like concrete. There's different types, but we have brick refractory or a castle refractory, or even this blanket refractory. Um, the refractory just acts basically as an insulating layer protect the steel. Um, so that refractory can take usually between 2,000 and 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit of, of temperature. There's a lot of different types of that. There's, almost, there's a whole field of engineering focused just on material selection for refractory. It's really interesting stuff. Um, it, it's a whole subset that you get into, but um, that is a critical aspect for our systems because it's probably the most expensive aspect of our system when you get down to the cost. The, st the shell out here, this is made typically of steel, typically of carbon steel. Sometimes we'll go stainless steel. It just depends. Um, in this case, we have our, our combustion chamber is integrated into our stack. And so we'll actually burn it here and come straight out the top and exit out there. A lot of times we have these what we call platforms, ladders and platforms on this so that you have access to the system. Many times we have measuring devices on this, instrumentation devices on this to measure the temperatures measures the emissions coming out of it, so you have to have access to those. So here is what a real vertical thermal oxidizer looks like. It doesn't really look like much, it just looks like a big steel can, but this is that burner we're talking about. This would be our combustion chamber and integrated stack and our ladders and platforms which you can get up there. Um, this one actually has a 
This blue box there is a, a louver. That's where they can open up a, a, a damper to allow air into the vessel. So sometimes it's automatically controlled, sometimes it's manually controlled. Just depends on how complex that is. Yes, sir? Do you ever recycle the heat? Ah, do we ever recycle the heat? So yes, and we'll talk about that. Um, that's a good question, though. So we, recycling heat, I mean, you're, you're using all this fuel gas to make all this heat. It's kind of silly to let it go out the stack. So we do, in some cases, recycle the heat. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. So this is a vertical thermal oxidizer. We also have it in a horizontal position. So basically, it's the same thing. We're just turning it on its side, so it's coming along the ground here, right? So we just have a burner firing horizontally. We still have to come out of stack, right? Because we still have to get rid of that heat and, and disperse those, those particles somewhere in the atmosphere. Does anybody know why you would prefer a vertical or horizontal, or vice versa? What were the, can any of you think of an advantage to having a vertical system versus a horizontal system? Yeah, footprints one. Absolutely, if you have a vertical system, you don't have to have this whole land area taken up for this system. What's a downside, though, of having a vertical system? Uh, I mean, that's, yeah, you're shooting heat up straight up now. It's not necessarily a downside, per se. Because they're both going to have the heat coming out of the stack, right? Probably a little more capital cost in the system, though, because you have a whole separate structure just to get there, whereas it's integrated before. But there's a downside to vertical systems. So if you have this versus this, what's one of the downsides you could think of? It has to be a lot taller. Don't need to be taller, per se. Um, it, so I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you. So the thing that is difficult is that how do you do maintenance on a system like this, right? How do you get into this? How do you, you get a ladder and you climb in? This is like a two-foot diameter system, right? How do you do maintenance on these systems? So the footprint's less, but it's a lot easier to get in here and do work when it's at grade versus trying to climb a ladder or get a man lift or a cherry picker. So there's different things you got to consider. There's pros and cons to each of those. Less cost, less footprint, easier maintenance, but higher cost. You got to decide which is, which is more important to you. Like I said here, this is actually a picture of our John Zink um, test center. The, you can't really tell right here, but here is the horizontal TO, and it comes out the stack here. So beyond those basic components, um, there's actually a lot more to the system than what, what I showed you in the, earlier system, in the earlier slides. But one of the most important things is you have to have a way to, to visually understand what's going on in the system, a way to instrument-wise monitor what's going on. So you have to have various connections and site ports to the unit so we can see what's happening inside the system. So we can't just open up a, uh, you know, a door on this and take a look in because you'll send your eyebrows and probably all your hair at the same time. So we have to have ways to, to see what's happening. So we have various site ports with a, a high temperature Pyrex glass. You've heard of Pyrex. It's what you make your, your brownies in, right? So same thing here. We have a site glass that's on a a flange so you can see what's going on, so you can visually look at the flare, the flame inside, make sure it's looking like it's supposed to. Um, we can also add instrumentation on here. We have UV scanners that can visually see what the flame is doing through UV or IR light, which of course the human eye can't all see. Um, so we have ports that we add to it to, to visually understand what's going on. Many times as well, we have this refractory line chamber. We'll also add what's called a choke, which is like a bluff body inside the chamber. Um, to restrict the opening at a certain location. Anyone know why we might add a choke inside of the chamber? To create turbulence, exactly. That's right. So that, that is something that we would do to help make sure we don't get laminar flow. We'll, we'll have a choke point at a certain location, typically two-thirds length of the vessel, to create a little extra mixing. So we get a lot of mixing early on, then it kind of evens out, so we kind of hit it again here at the back end. Now the downside is, is that these kinds of things create pressure drop, right? It's gonna, we need more pressure to get through. So we have to have a balance of, okay, turbulence is good, but we only have so much motive energy in our waste gas, so we gotta make sure we balance and understand that we don't create an issue there. So here's a close up of, the, of our test center. You can see here, these are these, these nozzles we're adding to the system. And these are actually glasses that you can see through, and you got these little, little gates on here. You can lift up this gate and see through. So that helps you understand. You can see what's happening because otherwise you're just kind of flying blind. So we have to add this so at least the operators of this equipment have some idea what's happening in the system. So I talked about refractory. That's what's inside the system. 
Here's a couple shots. This one's actually in operation. It's glowing cherry red. This brick's probably 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit here. Uh, it's pretty hot. But there's almost an infinite different types of these. Um, again, it, there's, there's bricks type, which are like a typical brick. It's just made of a certain um, compound to take heat. We also can do like a, like a concrete pour. We'll make a form with anchors, and we'll actually just mix up this material and pour it in like, we're, like a concrete form. Um, we have some that's made of a fiber blanket material. That's good to super high temperatures as well. Just depends on what we're doing. They each have their own pros and cons. Some are more expensive at higher temperature. Some are less expensive, can take variations in temperature really well, but maybe they're susceptible to high velocity of, of gases and they pull apart. So when you're designing, you've got to think about all these variables that come into play of, okay, what, what do I need to have as my system to be as cheap as possible, but also as robust as possible? I talked about we've got to have air to get in the system. We have to have a way to control what's what's uh, amount of air is coming in. We don't want to just give it too much air. We'll, we'll be too lean, right? We're not going to get the temperature we need, or at least we'll take a lot of natural gas to make up for that. But also, we don't want to choke the system. We don't want to be um, w reducing the atmosphere, which causes our temperatures to go up. We don't get complete combustion. So we have a natural draft system, which uses that damper I talked about. It's just a louver that's got little, little gates on it that open and close. Or we'll add a fan. We'll add a, what we call a combustion air fan. And this fan basically injects air into the system. I cut the picture off here, but this fan's quite large. Um, there's a guy over here that's standing about that tall. So that's about a six foot, seven foot diameter fan. It's quite large. So that's going to blow air into the system. And so we can put um, devices on this called a VFD to control how fast it's spinning to control how much air is going into the system. So I talked about how we have to, to vertically disperse our waste gases, right? We have to get these into the atmosphere. Um, so the comment that we build a stack, there's various types of stacks. We have a self support that we call, which basically makes the shell so thick it can stand up by itself. Um, maybe we'll make a derrick support, which is basically a be a thinner material and they'll add all these angles around to hold it up at the structure or a guy wire support it, which is kind of like these telephone things you've seen before. They actually hold it down with these very high tensioned um, um, guy wires. Same like bridges, same principle there. So we have different ways to do it. Again, there's different types of uh, cost benefits to each of these that you're also looking at when you're designing these systems. So I mentioned earlier that you know, we're, we're, we're going through the system at a certain um, time. We have to be in the system for so long. Um, obviously, we're controlling that by, by the, the diameter of the system. One thing we're also worried about, too, is the velocities. So typically, when we're designing any part of the system, whether it be the air coming in or the waste gas coming in, we're going to be between 50 and 100 feet per second. If you go above that, typically it's too high. It's going to cause higher pressure drop and other issues for us. So let's talk about the burner, because the burner is really where all of the real details of what's happening in the system are, are originating from. This is the type of burner we use to define what the maximum emission level is going to be for the system. It's going to define how well it mixes. It's going to define what it can and cannot burn. At John's Inc., we probably have um, 200 types of different burners we've had, developed over the years. And at any given time, we're using different burners depending on different applications. Some require super low NOx. Some require not such low NOx, but need to have a very wide range of, of compositions we can carry. So it just depends. Um, you know, a lot of times we talk about our burners in terms of cars, right? You can have a Ferrari, high performance, great car. It's the best performance, the fastest car, but it's also probably the most expensive and the highest maintenance, right? Versus, say, you go for a Honda Civic. OK, it's not as exciting as a Ferrari, but get you from point A to point B. It doesn't take a lot of maintenance. It's not as expensive. Um, so you kind of have to look at what's going on in the system and what the customer's <laughs> needs are, and then you choose accordingly. But within a typical burner, this is about as basic as we get. We've got a fuel gun down the center. This is going to be burning natural gas or propane or maybe some refinery fuel gas they have. That's where it's going to generate most of our heat. Okay? That's what's giving us our heating content. We have a pilot beneath it. The pilot is what we use, of course, to light this fuel gas. This is not light by itself, so we have to have a, a, a pilot there to light it. 
We'll then also have some other site ports to be able to see what's going on or put a scanner on there. We'll have a place for our waste to come in and a place for our air to come in. And there's hundreds of different types of waste that's come in. You have a question? Just stretching. Beyond that, we also have some other things going on here. So we have the chamber here, but we have this thing called a burner tile. And a burner tile is a piece of refractory that we cast in a specific mold. And just like our burner tips, we designed them to have certain geometries. This burner tile is used to help anchor the flame and control the flame pattern. So this, we actually use this tile, which is a piece of castable material, the same thing as we do our burner tips. So these two combined create the flame envelope, they create and shape the flame, and they are what help us control how the system is operating. So what happens is, of course, we're making this big old fireball here. In this case, we're bringing our, we call it tail gas, but it's this waste. We're bringing it around this annular gap. There's a gap around this, like a donut, all the way around this burner. And it's coming into this flame envelope and combusting. So all of this combined is going to create the mixing environment to create this. And so then it's going to come into this chamber, and it's going to burn for one second, two seconds, at 600 degrees Fahrenheit, and then out the stack. Here's a better picture with a better description. So I don't know if you guys can see really well. You guys all kind of sat over here. But we have a burner tip. That's what actually is creating the, the fuel gas. We also put a cone around it. This cone actually helps us anchor the flame on the burner tip. If we just had a, a piece of pipe with a hole in it, the flame's going to want to lift off, lift away from that. This cone creates a bluff body that helps anchor the flame on top of it. We also have our pilot over here. In this case, we also added some other various gas tips around. So we have a primary tip down the center. And we have smaller gas tips all the way around. Does anybody know why we do that? Why would we have a big gas tip down the middle and smaller ones around the perimeter? Any idea why we do that? If you have a fire, right? You got a big fire and you got a log. Do you just take one big log and throw it on there, or do you kind of split them up, spread the flame out? You want to, you want to, kind of. If you just have one big flame down the middle, you're going to have cool sections on the outside. So we break it up, and so we add these ports around it to kind of even out the flame pattern. It gets you a nice, even distribution of heat so that any waste gas that can't get to the middle, we have these out here to help make sure we're getting the heat levels. So if everything goes right, hopefully it looks a bit like this. So you can't really tell, but there's actually a lot of heat coming down the center. But it's not burning too lot here. But you can see these bluer flames out here is where those, those smaller secondary gas tips are at. That's what a typical burner likes. But you can see, you don't really have a lot of viewing angle on these things. That side glass is limited. So that's about all you can typically see in the system. Here is what one looks like in the shop. So here's that burner tip down the center. Here's that cone that we use to create a bluff body to keep the flame anchored on it. This circle right here, that's where the pilot is going to be inserted through so they can light that. And we have these ports here are actually ports where we're going to be injecting secondary gas. And this right here is actually they're test fitting this for our burner tiles. These are those, those cast pieces. And you can't really tell, but there's actually some geometry at the bottom. Of this. There's a ledge there that's shaping that flame. So that's all critical. All these pieces combined are what's going to define what that flame shape looks like. And on the back side, this is the part you can see from the outside. These are all the various connections and nozzles that we have to connect to or, or look through. So here's kind of the 3D animation. Let's kind of go through it real quick. Not much to it. Here's what a flame should look like if everything's working right. So the actual fun part of the job, burning stuff. So it's nice, stable. I don't know what, what size burner this is, but you can see it's kind of a blue flame, um, like a butane torch. You've probably seen a butane torch, something like that. That's what a, a good burner flame looks like. That's what a good flame pattern looks like. Uh, that's uh, what a typical burner should look like in terms of good performance. Now, not all burners look like that. Here is that same burner, but purposely made wrong. You see that flame? It makes a cool looking flame. It's burning stuff. But you can see it's orange, yellow. It's kind of sporadic. It's kind of all over the place. 
So this technically is working. You know, this is burning those gases, but this is going to have much higher emissions performance than the other unit. And being that ours is a pollution control device, you think a customer would be happy if uh, their flame doesn't look like this when it's supposed to? No. So what do you think happens if they don't meet their performance? If our flame doesn't look like it's supposed to, it looks like this. What do you think is going to happen to our customer in the field when they're operating this? They're going to get fined, right. And the fines that they talk about, these refineries, are numbers that you and I probably can't comprehend um, in the millions of dollars a day sometimes. Um, so it's critical that when we're designing our systems that we're, we're doing all this right um, because they're, they're relying on us to do that. I've heard the number that when we have equipment that's late to a job site or late to a customer, the figure that we talk about is a million dollars per day for a lot of these systems. It depends on the unit. Some smaller plants, not as much. But your typical refinery, we're talking a million dollars a day. Every day our system's not working right. So talk about pressure. So I talked a lot about gases. We, we burn mainly gases in incinerators, but we also do burn some liquids. Um, we typically don't just run liquids down the center. We have to have a way that we control how the liquids are entering the system. Um, and there's different types of liquids. There's high BTU waste, so high exothermic or low BTU waste liquids. And depending on what that is, it depends on what we do. But when we're burning liquids, what we're actually doing is we're going to run that liquid through what we call a, a steam gun or a, a liquid gun, and we're going to atomize it. So we're going to put it through um, this chamber that mixes with air and steam, and it's going to atomize that steam and inject it as a mist. What we want to do is we want to make those particles as small as possible so that we can have it interact with our flame and burn up. So in this case, what we're showing here is we have a burn down the center. Maybe some, there's some waste with it. But we have this liquid we're going to burn as well. Typically, when we're burning liquids, we don't put them right down the middle. We don't put them where the waste gas goes in. We put them around, around the burner. And so again, we'll have that, that waste coming in with an air or steam um, motivating force, and it's going to atomize those wastes so that this becomes a mist as it hits this flame. That's how we'll take care of that. There are different ways we can do that. We can also do it um, in different combinations, but we can handle some liquids. But typically, when we're talking incinerators, most of it is gas. We're burning mainly gas. So I, just, I briefly touched on this, the pilot, earlier. Um, the pilot's the part that lights the main, main burner here. Typically, this is an afterthought for most facilities. This is the part that they don't, you know, just light the flame and move on, right? But I'm in aftermarket. So in aftermarket, like at a car plant, we're doing with parts, right? But also I deal with services. I deal with anything that's not operating. And um, the pilot's one of those things that this is like the key thing. If this isn't working, you're not, you're not running the plant. You can make up for a lot of burner issues, but you can't make up if your pilot's not working. If you can't light the flame, you're dead in the water. So we spend a lot of time um, designing pilots, making sure they're robust. Um, it's, it's probably the single most key maintenance item. And the thing to keep in mind is when we're talking about thermal oxidizers is that normally we light them once every five years. Two to five years is a typical maintenance cycle. So they'll light it once, and that system will operate for two or three years, five years, before they come down again. So that operator that lit that burner five years ago, he may have retired. He may be gone, whatever. And uh, so we spent a lot of time training and doing with pilots. So I'll talk about those for a brief moment here. And when we talk about pilots, there's, there's two types. We have what we call a natural draft type that simply inducts air like your, your gas grill. It just has air, it just flows in, and it lights off itself. Or we have what's called forced air. That's where we take a pilot and we actually supply it with its own air supply through an air compressor or something else like that. And there's two types of ignition, right? So we have a high voltage ignition. That's uh, you've probably seen, you know, different types of igniters that kind of the bzzz, like on your, um, your gas uh, grill at home or your, uh, your stove maybe. Also, you have high energy. High energy is like a high capacitance discharge. Um, they have different pros and cons. I won't go into all the details of them, but there's just lots of different types of things we can do, lots of different ways that we operate pilots. Different parts of pilots. I won't talk about every single one of them. But here is what our standard pilot looks like. This is the part that inserts into the flame. That's, of course, the part where we're lighting the burner. 
inside of this, we actually have an igniter. So we have this connected to electricity. We have a little probe that goes all the way down the inside of this that you can't see. See it right here at the end, though. And that's where our spark's made, right? That's the spark part that's lighting our, our flame. This pilot's unique in that it actually has, we give it both natural gas as well as air here. So this whole line here is filled with air and gas. It's a fully premixed pilot. So when this thing sparks, it's going to light at the tip every time. And it should look like this. Nice, pretty blue flame. The fact that it's pre-mixed, we're giving it that its own air and gas supply means it's going to be very reliable for our customers. But we can even make it look like that if we want to. That's a high heat release pilot. This is 13 million BTUs of heat we're shooting out. We don't normally shoot them in an atmosphere like this, but it looked cool for a video, so we did it anyway. But here is what our typical pilot looks like. So there's actually a burner next to this. Can you see this even? It's pretty dark there. Anyway, you can see there's a little blue flame here. That's right next to the burner. And so this pilot will light, typically, and then we'll bring on our waste gas to our, and our fuel gas to the burner, and then we'll get a big flame that shoots out here. But one of the things that's pretty cool about some of these pilot systems is, like I said, it has to be reliable, it has to be robust. A lot of ignition systems have problems with what we call shorts. That's when you get moisture in the line. Um, so you may have experienced this with cars and things like this. Um, but high energy systems don't care about moisture. They can actually light underwater, which is pretty cool. So we're showing it spark underwater here, which is pretty cool, I always thought. But the thing is, too, I mentioned this premix. We're giving it its fuel and air. The one thing that allows us to do is create our own atmosphere. So even though this pilot's completely submerged underwater, when we bring our air and gas on, we are actually controlling the atmosphere which we're sparking. And if we really want to, we can actually light our pilot underwater altogether. So there's a flame literally underwater that's burning. Now, of course, we don't have customers that are burning things underwater. This is just kind of for, for show. But what we're just showing here is in terms of reliability, robustness, we have to have systems that can handle all sorts of things. But I just thought it was a cool video to show. So we talked about the basic thermal oxidizer. You know, we went through all this. This is our burner, fuel and air, waste coming into a chamber with refractory. Some instrumentation, some side ports coming out of stack. One of you was smart enough to think about, hey, what about all that heat? The gentleman here, right? So we have all this heat. So we're, we're, we're burning fuel and making heat. All that just goes out the stack. We're just really just wasting it. It's going nowhere, right? So in a lot of applications, we'll actually take the, the heat that we're generating and we'll reuse that in similar application. Okay, either maybe we're going to preheat some other oil they have that they have to take heat up somewhere else that saves them a burner or they want to preheat something. Sometimes we even preheat our own waste, right? So in this case, we have our burner, it's firing flames. It's coming through a heat exchanger, probably with fire tubes. And we won't have it, it won't mix here. It just, it's just a show. But we'll actually have one section, this will be for the heat, and one section will be for our waste. And we'll have a, a metal barrier between the two where we're actually having um, heat exchange between the two. So relatively cool waste coming in to hot flame. We're going to preheat this waste with this heat. And then here's where it actually comes in the system. So we're, we're basically we're using some of that lost energy to preheat this. So it's going to save us money over time. Okay, it's an economic decision. So uh, um, we do this in a lot of applications. Now, can any of you think of why you may not want to do this for all types of waste? Why would you not want to bring in? A cold waste in with this heat. Anybody think of something more? Increase in NOx. Not, not specifically NOx. That probably wouldn't impact as much here. We can control that. Like a change in temperature. Change in temperature, right. So some of our wastes, I showed you earlier, it's nasty stuff, right? It's, it's materials that if they condense, it's going to eat through almost any material we have. Um, so it's going to be a maintenance issue. If we get a cold material here that condenses, or if it doesn't properly um, coat those materials, we get, a, we get a hole somewhere in here over time, which we're still talking very high temperatures, it can be a maintenance issue for us. 
and then you have this waste combining with heat before we want it to, and uh, in some cases that can cause what we call a deflagration, which is engineering speak for explosion. We don't want that. But if we know what it is, we design materials properly, we can make this work. So this is actually called a recuperative thermal oxidizer. So that's what I talked about earlier, an RTO. So we're regenerating some of the heat, recuperative thermal oxidizer. So again, it, it, it can actually help you control um, lower fuel use. We can actually get slightly higher destruction efficiency through a recuperative system because we're able to preheat it, actually get to our, um, our uh, combustion point much faster than typical unit. Uh, limitations, like I said, materials of construction, we've got to be careful. We don't want to cause ourselves to corrode out or, or lose material. Um, also, too, these are a little more susceptible to um, spikes in our waste flow. They don't recover as fast as a typical unit. Another unit I talked about, um, what we call a catalytic thermal oxidizer. Okay, catalytic thermal oxidizer. So it's similar to a recuperative system. We've got a burner. And we're bringing our waste in here, and it's going to get hot before we come in. But here, we have a catalyst. Does anybody know what a catalyst actually is? Do you guys? Speeds up reaction. Speeds up reaction, right? Some kind of material that doesn't actually physically change the material. It's something that it reacts with and allows you to create a different reaction or lower temperatures. So in this case, we have several types of catalysts that we use that allow us to actually do most of our, our chemical conversions at much lower temperatures. So typically, we're at 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Most of these are between 300 to 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you can think that saves a lot on your, your cost of fuel gas throughout the course of the system. So this is typically done when we're trying to save money on utilities. So again, lower temperature, so you get lower fuel use, still gets good DRE. Um, can anybody think of some limitations? I got them on here, but can, you, can any of you think of why these limitations are there? Catalyst life, for one, right? Higher maintenance. So that catalyst gets used up. We utilize, we use up what chemical properties creates that, that conversion. So you've got to shut the unit down and replace that catalyst every three to six months, maybe a year. It just depends on how much you're using it. Also, to, yes, sir? So both ways, right? We can, we can ruin the catalyst by having, say, we, we spec. We, we choose this catalyst because it's good at converting whatever this waste is. But oh, they, they forgot they also had this in their waste. It just ruined that catalyst because it's not good for that. Or vice versa, maybe that catalyst is leaching out. We're actually getting catalyst components in our waste downstream. It didn't, it, for some reason, it's not properly converting, right? Um, that usually happens when they don't tell us what they're actually burning. It's so critical for us to know that if they tell us the wrong information, we spec this material, oh, it's not really that. Well, guess what? The whole system has to be redone or respect. Is that considered masking then when you get catalyst coming off? Masking. No, they don't call that masking. I, I've not heard that at least. What is, what is masking? It's, it's all that I was thinking. Masking. Oh, okay. Well, that's poisoning is what I would call it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't make the slide, sorry. All right, so we got another, t another type of TO. This one's called regenerative thermal oxidizer. You can probably figure out by looking at what's happening here. So what we have is a basic unit with a burner coming into a chamber. Okay? But you can see right, what we're doing is actually cycling through beds of material. These beds are usually full of uh, um, a charcoal material or some sort of, of packing material, which is a whole other subfield of, of engineering that I didn't know existed either. There's literally probably 100 people in the world that do this kind of packing material that different geometries that do different things. But these beds are full of materials that we then cycle the waste gas through. It burns. Echo animation. And it comes out. And then what we do is we actually cycle which bed goes out. So we start, cold comes in, hot goes out. Then we close this, and then we bring the cold in through the hot bed. So we're warming it up in this bed that's hot, and it's going out. But since that bed's constantly cooling, we're putting the cool stuff through. We, we have valves and instrumentation that allows us to cycle which bed we're going in and out of. So we'll actually design the system to time it or put thermocouples on it to, to see how long we're getting the temperatures. And we'll cycle through these beds 
to kind of preheat that by using the energy from the last batch of material that came through, if you will. So this is called a regenerative thermal oxidizer. So these systems generally have, have good destruction efficiency. Like the other ones, they have lower fuel use since you're using the energy from the last part of your combustion process to preheat the new materials. Uh, typically, they have very low NOx, which is great. Um, but they're limited in that we have to have the controls that operate these beds, right? The controls are expensive and complicated. Also, we have these, these beds, like in the catalyst system, that are full of materials that have to be replaced or, or maintained in some capacity. So that may be a limiting factor. Typically, for a lot of our systems, the, the catalyst and this regenerative type those are the smaller systems. Those are for, for smaller boutique plants or, or boutique applications, at least compared to what we do. Um, they typically cannot handle the volumes of flows that the big, big chemical companies have. But they are relatively prevalent in the industry. A lot of, um, to talk about refineries and chemical plants, but a lot of these applications are actually like at, uh, you know, the Bayers or DuPonts of the world where they're making paints, or Harley Davidson where they're, they're actually painting their, their um, motorcycles or car companies, they typically have incinerators on the back end of those plants because of all these, these fumes coming off there to burn. So a lot of those applications use these kind of um, regenerative type or recuperative type because they're smaller volumes than, say, an ExxonMobil that's making thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons of gas every hour. So beyond recuperative TOs, we actually can use our heat and other applications. So in a lot of our, our units, we actually will have um, other types of heat recovery on it. And the most common one is adding a boiler. So like we talked about, right, we have all this heat. So why don't we generate steam? Which is steam is typically in most, most plants is a valuable resource. They use steam for lots of things, whether it be for heating up parts of the plant, heating up their piping, then needs, needs to preheat um, portions of their, their um, their chemicals are using, most of them use it even for parts of their um, instrumentation and cleaning supply items. So we, we actually will add a boiler that's just full of water and we'll use this heat to create our steam in the application that we have. So um, many plants, it's simply an economic decision. So um, in most applications, we're talking a, a, a payoff of two years or less for this. So it's usually a no brainer for most of our, our customers. They have to have the thermal oxidizer. Well, we're going to waste the fuel. We've got to burn the fuel to at least you know, make up for what we can. So they, they add this on. So I guess before I go to the next slide, do, you, do any of you guys know the three major types of, of heat transfer? Convection. 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 Right, you guys are on it. So see, I know you guys are all smart college students at the University of Tulsa, right? <laughs> so you guys already knew these. Conduction, convection and radiation. Did they take you guys to the John Zink test center? Yes. You guys did the flare test? Did they take you out back to this flare test? Yes. Yeah. Some of you, yes? Okay. They didn't start the flare for you? Okay. Well, it, it talk about radiation. I think radiation is one of these things that I didn't, I didn't fully grasp when I was younger when I was at John Zink. Um, you know, I always thought radiation was kind of, you know, it's far away, it can't be that much heat. You're going to get way more from convection or, or conduction, which is mostly true, but when we're talking our flares that are 200 foot long flames coming off. Um, we actually will have on the ground where you can kind of go stand and see it at a safe distance, but it's so hot, these long flames, that even standing 100 yards away, just looking at it for 10 seconds, it's like being two feet from a bonfire. It's so hot, it, it, it's, um, you have to turn away. But it's amazing that you can, take, you can see this big long flame, it's so hot, even just a sheet of paper you put in front of you, that little barrier can actually stop almost all the, the, the heat from radiation. It's really interesting. It doesn't take much actual volume or, or mass to block it, just any small physical barrier to stop it. So obviously within this system, we, we have all three types are present in most of our applications that we have um, in terms of, of heat and how it can transfer. So we use all that to come up with various types of heat recovery. So I'll talk a little bit about boilers and heat exchangers because they are a very critical part of what we do. Um, John Zink actually has a whole division that does just boiler burners. 
They build burners that are four boiler systems. So in this building right here, I'm sure there's a boiler or somewhere connected to this. There's a boiler that's making all the hot water that's going through this plant. So we have a whole, whole division, John, that focuses on that. Um, but are, are any of you familiar with boilers? Have any of you actually seen one or, or done any engineering on them? The mechanical team may have in thermodynamics. No. All you chemists are busy doing your, your molecules and all that stuff. But uh, within boilers, we have two main types. We have a fire tube type and a water tube type. And it took me a few years to figure it out, but once I realized how dumb I was, a fire tube means we have fire going down a tube. Okay, so we have this big vessel that's full of typically hundreds of tubes. And tubes are about that big around. And in a fire tube, we have what we call a tube sheet. It's basically just a wall where all these tubes protrude from. And they go all the way through this vessel here, which is welded on this side and that side. And just the tubes go through. And then this is full of water that's connected to a steam drum. And so what this does, of course, is we have our very hot gases coming through. That's transferring the heat to that that water, and that's going to generate steam as it boils off, right? So this is a fire tube boiler, and so then this will take that steam and they'll pipe it up accordingly so they can take off you know, the steam and then refill with water as it generates this process. This does not impact any of our, our, our incineration goals, right? By the time we hit this fire tube boiler, we've already done most of our conversion of our, our thermal oxidizing process. We've done our conversion. So this is really just recovering the heat and then after this, our waste gases just go out the stack or wherever else they're going on from after the thermal oxidizer. Here's the same thing, really, but just kind of in a, a different picture, a, a kind of more metallic look. But here, you see all these tubes here. Usually there's literally hundreds of these, these tubes coming through here. And there's different types of tubes. Um, the boiler industry, again, is one of those industries that is, that is there's thousands of companies that do it around the world. But um, boilers is, is a whole engineering uh, a field that's, that's also very deep in terms of the, the technologies they have and they're always looking how to get that much better thermal efficiency out. Every percent more makes them that much better in terms of their, their, their competitors, so very competitive field. Water tube is, is the same thing, but obviously now we have water in the tubes, not fire in the tubes. I don't know why it took me so long to figure it out. But anyway, um, we have a steam drum up here that's actually filling up um, with steam from below. So they call this a mud drum. This is really where the water is. And it's just full of water. And as this water gets hot in here, the steam comes up to the top and then they actually just take this off elsewhere. The, the thermal oxidizer process comes across these tubes and it transfers accordingly. So we show here that we have what we call bare tubes and we call fin tubes. Anybody think of what the difference is based on the terminology? That was the next question. So you beam into it. So yeah, the fin tubes, that's right. It's more uh, heat transfer. Now, why would you need fin tubes on the back end but not on the front end? It's getting colder. It's getting colder. That's right. We're, we're losing the, the, the delta T, so we're trying to make up for that by increasing the surface area. You guys are good. All right. So, again, that, how many tubes there are, you know, how big this is, all dependent upon how much steam we want to generate, how much heat we have to work with, all those variables to define what this really looks like. We also have these two things here called soot blower lanes. So right here. Why would we have these things called a soot blower? Anybody think about what that might be? What's a soot blower? So over time, right, we have this combustion process occurring. What's something that happens when you're burning something? What do you usually get? Some soot. You get like smoke, right? What do you think that does over time that accumulates on the tubes? That's right. So they have these little soot blowers that just kind of huff air or whatever, nitrogen, whatever it is every so often to help keep those tubes clean, helps keep their heat transfer up. So when we're talking about TOs, I talked about some of the, the things we need to know um, from our customers. There's a lot of chemical properties that really impact what our system is designed for. So we need to know, is it exothermic or endothermic? Um, we need to understand, you know, is this a variable flow rate? Is it very steady? Um, what are your permit limits? Uh, what about other limitations for operation? So some customers have requirements for us and we're designing a system and must operate for three years without maintenance. 
must operate revived without maintenance. Um, some of them even say it's a batch process that runs once a week for three hours, but it has to warm up and cool down in this time frame. So they need to define all these things for us to know what we're doing. These are not things that are on the shelf. Every one of these units that we build at Johns Inc. is custom to that one customer and what they do, what they specifically need. There are some off-the-shelf people that, that they have, okay, here's your size 2-inch burner, here's your 3-inch burner. It just depends. Yes, sir. South Dakota, he, he asked, do we ever have a system that, that matches one exactly before that we did? We can just kind of take that and do it again. Sometimes we can get awfully close, but it's never perfect, okay? There's always something that went a little different, but we do use a lot of kind of go-bys, if you will, right? You guys, your homework, right? You're doing an exam or something like that. You're going to look at previous things you've done to learn from and kind of just kind of redo the same thing. We do the same thing. It saves us time and money. Um, but we got to be careful because it's not exactly the same. We're going to get bit, and we're going to have to pay a lot of money to fix it in the field. So one thing you learn, too, it, you know, you don't learn this in school, but outside, you know, it's for us, about half is cheap for us to fix something in our fabricator or our shop than it is in the field. Everything's twice as expensive in the field to fix. So we have a lot of motivation to get it right the first time. And again, what, what, are, what are the needs they have? Do they, do they need steam? Maybe they don't need steam. Maybe they have, they don't, they want something else. Maybe they're going to preheat that waste gas. Um, and what's interesting, too, is that different customers have different things they value. In the U.S., natural gas is really, really cheap. Um, in China and Asia, natural gas is expensive. Um, in some places, water is expensive, right? In the U.S., water is clean. It's readily available. What about in Puerto Rico, right? I mean, they're next to the ocean, but you can't use ocean water for these applications. So water for them is probably more expensive than natural gas. So there's a lot of things that people value differently that we're utilizing. But at a minimum, at a minimum, these are the things that we need to know at a minimum to begin design a system. So what are you burning? Okay. How much of it are you burning? What are your emission limits? And that could be from local or federal. Within the U.S., it's both state by state and federally. Um, places like China, of course, it's a lot mandated by the government. Um, it just depends. And again, what are your mechanical requirements? So what are, you, what are your utilities available? Is it 120 volt, 220 volt, 320 volt? What you, what's your electrical requirements? Um, what other items do you have available for us? So all this information would be helpful for us to design the system for what they need. So once we have this, we can go in and figure out what's the size, what's the height, what's our optimum recommendation. And then we go through six to eight months of iterations of drawing and working with the customer. Okay, here's what we got. They come back and say, well, no, that's not quite right. I'd, I'd like to have this equipment do this, or I need to avoid this other piece of equipment that's in this spot already, so we'll build around that, things like that. So it takes, typically for us to do a whole ground-up system is about 8 to 12 months. We can do it faster than that if we have to, but um, typical is 8 to 12 months. So wrapping up a little bit here, so we talked about thermal oxidizers how we design these, what the general principles are, talked about those three T's of combustion. What are the three T's? Talked about what we need to know for, for our, our design principles and some various configurations. So these are all, this is all high level, right? So I've given you the, the 101, the Cliff Notes version of thermal oxidizers. Um, on Thursday, we'll talk a little more about specifics. So how do we get low NOx? How do we get, um, take care of certain compounds? I, I showed you some um, hydrochlorides. I showed you H2S earlier on. How do we burn these sulfur compounds so we get things that we can burn and, and breathe afterwards or treat afterwards? So I'll show you a little more details then. Um, it may be twice as boring. It may be twice as interesting. I don't really know. But uh, hopefully this was helpful for you guys to get an idea of what is this, this thing I never heard of before and or even... I see again in my life, but um, I hope that you guys can at least see what's a real field that you guys can get into after you've been here for four or five, maybe six years for some of you. It just depends. Um, but I really appreciate your time. Um, any questions about John Zink or thermoxides that you have? Right, check. South Dakota, any questions there on your side? Getting some head shakes. Okay, well, I appreciate your time, guys, and uh, I'll catch you on Thursday.